philosophical issues in other venues. Now, fortunately, I've, I've got some good news in that in the United States, we are doing a fairly good job of this, that we are keeping religion largely out of the science classroom, or at least nominally out of the science classroom. And one of the reasons is that we've got a bunch of great organizations that are working very hard to do this, and I'll mention a few of these right now. Uh, National Center for Science Education is a wonderful organization headed by Eugenie Scott, uh, and they are, they are the central clearinghouse in the United States for information on the creationism movement. They're there to give advice. They will talk to teachers and help them out with these sorts of things. When there is a trial that comes up where somebody is trying to introduce creationism in the classroom, they will call the National Center for Science Education and they will help them out, send consultants there, send them information. Uh, they are a great resource. And so the first thing I have to do is praise these guys. These are doing great work. They are doing the best job they can at protecting the classroom. Uh, I also mentioned Eric and United for Separation of Church and State. We, have, we do have a uh, statement in our constitution that says that the, that the government will not establish any religion. And uh, as you may have known, if you pay any attention to the news from farther south, uh, there are lots of people trying to break through that wall of, of separation. And uh, Americans United is the big group that's working very hard to lobby and keep the government clean of religious interference. So they're also heroes. And of course the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, this, these are civil rights issues. Is people should be free to think as they want. And they should not be have, have things imposed on them, like religious ideas, especially bogus religious ideas that have no, no substance, uh, that we should be uh, vigilant in keeping those out of government, out of the classroom. Also in the United States, we have another advantage. Uh, we have tremendous legal precedents. This is, this is an amazing record. We, we've lost one major creationist trial. That was the Scopes trial. It was overthrown on a technicality. That was in 1925. But ever since, there have been all these trials coming up. Uh, the ones I put up in bold up there where it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in every case, those trials have ended in defeat for the creationists. So we've been doing a good job of keeping that, that intrusion in the classroom from happening. Uh, you know, what we have is both this, this wonderful precedent, and precedent, precedent should be important in judging the law. Uh, we've also had this great benefit that creationists are idiots. And that, <laughs> If any of you read the transcripts of the Dover trial, you saw that, that boy, they just blew it from the very beginning. They, did, they, they, just, they just blew their own case away right from the start. Uh, so it's been a great advantage. So it, you know, in, in one sense, we can say we've got legal precedent that really helps us, but what's really helping us a lot is that the creationists aren't very good at doing this. Okay, so that's the end of the good news. Okay. So we're, we're, we're doing this good job in the courts. But on the other hand, uh, the, the big message I would give here is that we're losing in the United States. We are losing the war against creationism. That isn't a popular message. I've talked to some of the people at the National Center for Science Education. They get very cranky with me when I tell them that, that they're, not, they're not doing the substantial job that we need in order to accomplish a long-term victory. That what they're doing is a fantastic job of defending using legal means, the intrusion of creationism in the classroom. But that's not where the war is being fought. The, the classroom is, is relatively intact, but the, the real war is being fought in the broader culture around us. And it's not going to be settled in the courtroom. They are not going to just sit back. Like I said, they're, they're doing a terrible job in the, in, in the courtroom, but they're doing a phenomenal job of spreading these horrible ideas through the wider culture at large. So it does us no good if we've got these centurions standing before the door of the, of the science classroom and keeping the priests out of it, when the priests then get the students when they come out of it and indoctrinate them into some very silly ideas. And so the students come back into the classroom, they populate the classroom with people who reject the teacher's ideas, who are dismissive of basic concepts of science. 
So the centurions are standing there, but we're working in our classrooms with people who are ignoring most of what we say. And it's a real struggle. Uh, I've talked to many high school teachers. This is, this is painful stuff in the high schools in my area. That uh, students are coming in and they're refusing to accept this stuff. If the teacher announces that they are going to teach evolution in the classroom, uh, parents storm the classroom. And they yell at the teacher. And teachers are human beings too. They don't like being yelled at. They don't want to have this kind of stress. They, they're underpaid, they're overworked, and now you've got people yelling at them about the curriculum. Uh, it doesn't work. What we often find, and this, is, this has been the, uh, the work of Randy Moore at the University of Minnesota, who's been analyzing this statistically. He's been screening students and asking them, what did you get exposed to in the high school classroom? They've been going to high school and asking what the teachers are teaching. And they've discovered that in Minnesota, which has got a reputation as a fairly progressive state, uh, about half of our students are not being taught anything about evolution at all. The teachers are choosing either to defer it, you know, put, let's put evolution at the very end of the curriculum, you know. That last week of, of spring, we'll, we'll teach evolution. And as we all know, curricula tend to slip over time, and that's, that's the one that will get lost. It will get pushed off the edge, and it will never get taught. Or there are many teachers who have this idea that, well, it's okay if I teach creationism if I also teach evolution. So they're sitting up there, and the students are getting exposed to these two ideas, which are not competing ideas, which are not equal ideas, and being treated, they're being treated as if they're equal in the science classroom. So it's a, it's a total mess. We're not getting anywhere with this. We can look at the data and see that it, it's really true. That this is, this is a, a little chart that lots of us crusaders against creationism use a lot. Uh, it's a chart of the opinion of populations in various countries where they're talking about their, whether they uh, accept evolution as true. That's the blue bar. That's Iceland. They're, they're, they're good guys. Look at there. That's, that's a pretty good high percentage. They're saying we don't accept it. We accept it as true. The red bars are those who flat out reject it and say it's false. Uh, the yellow ones are the ones that are saying maybe. And I, I really don't mind the ones who say I don't know. I don't know is a perfectly good answer to give. So the, the scary ones are the, the ones here that were absolutely certain that a well-established science scientific principle is, is absolutely false. Uh, there's Iceland up there, and we have to go scan it all the way down here. Second from the bottom, there's the United States. Where's Canada? I'm glad somebody asked. You know, I, I actually was teaching them about, I was showing my students this last week, and you will be pleased to know that American students in Minnesota asked that very same question. They looked at this and they said, where's Canada? And, of course, there's a smart ass, I just went north of here, but, but no. Uh, It has not changed much at all. We've been stuck at around 50% accepting and 50% rejecting. Uh, so I looked up Canada. Canada, Canada. there's another study that, that analyzed Canada, and about 58% of the Canadian po population say evolution is true. So it puts them kind of in the middle of the pack. I know Canadians are used to that, right? But, <laughs> but still, you'll be pleased to see, much better than the United States. But keep working on it. You'll get, you'll get up there around Iceland levels any time now. So, yeah, this, this is strange. You know, this, the United States likes to brag about how we're the best at everything. We're, we're so technologically oriented. We've we got the best science labs, et cetera. It's, and, and, you know, it's not true. Europe and Canada all have great science labs as well. But we like to brag that way. But then you see this data from the population at large and it's catastrophic. We're down near the bottom. So we beat Turkey. Right? <laughs> that's, that's where we're at. This, this is where we're losing, is somehow the population at large is just not missing, is just completely missing the whole idea of evolution. Where is this problem coming from? Well, it's coming from our school system. As I mentioned, Randy Moore has done all this work in Minnesota. And he said, okay, teachers aren't teaching it. Uh, what we've done is we've also looked at this other data, which is state science standards. Uh, what we have is in each of our states, they're supposed to have a document, a master document for the state, that lists the major concepts that are expected to be taught at each grade level. Okay, so all the teachers 
have a set of guidelines. You know, if you're, if you're an earth science teacher,